let, let me let me first of all try and see if I could I could sort of play the role of of um, of teacher, so to speak, or, or, or lecturer initially in this presentation, um, and and that is to try to explain to see if we can get a, a, a sort of a conceptual handle on what it is we are talking about when we talk about dollarization, because we need to understand it conceptually. Um, I think um, um, President Samalea from, from San Rafael Aruba sort of talked about him. He talked about things like partial dollarization and so on. Um, and, and so it's important to understand what the, what the various kinds of exchange rate regimes are and, and why countries have different exchange rate regimes. And certainly if you look at the countries which have certain exchange rate regimes, you see a certain pattern emerging. Uh, and at the other end of the scale, you see countries that are dollarized and you see a certain pattern emerging there. So there is a pattern that you see that can help guide us in terms of selecting what is the most appropriate exchange rate regime. Now, the way to think about it, I think, is that uh, on, 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 the, on the one scale, if you like, um, it is, you, you have the question of uh, what you might call policy independence, meaning that uh, the, you, you want to have your government in a sovereign territory, and I, I just want us to put a place marker on that word sovereign, because it's an important word in the context of dollarization. The, 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 the government of a sovereign territory would want to have a degree of policy independence, meaning that when things happen in the outside world, when, for example, oil prices fall, or the US dollar appreciates, or there is war in Iraq, external events happen. What you would want in your own domestic circumstances, that you want to be able to manage those domestic circumstances in a way that suits you best. Which is to say that you then want to have a degree of, of flexibility in using certain tools to maintain stability in the economy, to keep inflation under control, to manage your foreign exchange reserves, and to manage growth. Those are the things that our politicians, our governments are concerned about. And what are the tools that, 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 that uh, our politicians want to use? They would want to use, obviously, fiscal policy. So you want to manage revenues, tax revenues. So governments typically would raise taxes or lower taxes. Most people want them to lower taxes, of course. There are certain circumstances where it is appropriate for government to raise taxes. Uh, and I think that if you look across the region, if you're looking across the Caribbean region, what you have seen, of course, in the last 15 to 20 years is that almost all territories have introduced value-added taxes as part of their whole fiscal reform efforts to try to, to provide a sustainable basis for government revenues. So you have fiscal policy, which is managing your revenues and expenditures, managing the deficit, managing the debt that results from running deficits over a period of time, and to ensure that your debt profile as an economy is sustainable. Uh, and we have various markers for that. I mean, economists use certain kinds of ratios that you should look at and so on. Another important tool is the exchange rate, <clears throat> because the exchange rate is important in, in, ter in terms of determining as well your competitiveness. So that depending on the type of economy that you are, your exchange rate can become extremely important in terms of determining how your exports grow or don't grow. Now, one of the things that we need to be very careful about, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious of the fact that we're not speaking to all economists here. I know there is one economist in the audience, so I need to be very careful. I don't want to say anything wrong. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the things that we need to be very careful is that economists think and talk in terms of what we call real variables. We are not interested in nominal quantities. So that if you tell me that the exchange rate between the Gilda and the US dollar is 179 or 180, or whatever it is, and so on, for economists, that is a nominal quantity. It doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> it, doesn't, it doesn't mean that your exchange rate is higher than that of Japan, <laughs> for example, which is about whatever it is, 100 to, to 1. It doesn't mean that. Right? So nominal quantities are, quite frankly, irrelevant as far as the economists are concerned. We are concerned about real quantities. And therefore, what can your money buy in terms of real goods and services? And then what happens to those nominal quantities over time? And what it is happens to nominal quantities over time has to do with inflation. So that if your, in your country, inflation in your country is proceeding faster than that of your trading partners, 
then even if your nominal exchange rate remains the same at 179 or 180, you are in fact appreciating your dollar, your currency. Your currency is appreciating. If your inflation is going faster than that of your trading partners, you are appreciating. Now you've held the exchange rate here constant since 1971, right? So there is no doubt that as far as uh, these countries are concerned, Curacao, Aruba, uh, St. Martin, your currency has in the Dutch Guilder, the, the Netherlands Antilles Guilder, has in fact appreciated. So we need to make sure that we are focusing on the, on the right levers, and we need to talk about real quantities. Now, I'll come back to the politicians and, and, and the governments. Governments typically want to spend more than they earn because they want to get things done. But they have to manage that deficit. The problem is that when governments run deficits, it puts pressure on the balance of payments, and it tends to cause the foreign exchange reserves to decline. And that's the problem. And that's the problem. So that if governments tend to become profligate, they're spending more than they should, they're not conscious of managing debt, and they're not keeping an eye on the foreign exchange reserve situation, then you are going to have problems. And this is where central bankers come in. You see, the central banker's responsibility is to ensure that the governments behave themselves. <clears throat> right? And historically, over the course of the last couple of centuries, central banks exist because governments sent executives the executive politicians have given control of that part of policy to central banks. So central banks are part of the government in a sense, but they act independently in controlling, taking away from our politicians an important tool of policy, which is control of the money supply, the issuing of the domestic currency, because if you left it in the hands of the politicians, they are going to debase the currency, all of them. But it is true, history has proved it, okay? And no matter what the politicians come and tell you that, well, when I get into office, I will not do it, they all do it, okay? And the reason why they do it is not because they're bad people. These, look at these gentlemen in front of us here. They're, 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 they're wonderful people. But, 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 the problem, but the problem is, the problem is that once you get into office, that, that the pressure you are getting to, from the population to perform and to deliver goods and services, to build new roads and bridges and new airports and, and so on and so forth. All of that give, puts pressure on the politicians to spend. And, and, and economists will say, well, you can't do that because you don't have the resources to do that. Now, so let's come back to the question of what do we mean in terms of exchange rate regimes in that, in that context. Countries at the furthest end of the scale, and let's look on down here, would be countries like the United States, United Kingdom, France, the people in the Euro, and so on, right? Where they have complete policy independence and their currencies are freely floating. Mr. Obama doesn't worry about what the US dollar too much. It's not really his job. He doesn't worry about it too much, right? He has a Federal Reserve, they watch it. But he doesn't, he's not concerned about it. One of the reasons why the United States is not concerned about the US dollar is because everybody wants it. The Russians want it, the Chinese want it, everybody wants it, we want it, right? So he's not concerned about it. So in fact, the United States is the one country in the world, quite frankly, which really does not have to worry about its fiscal deficits in terms of people accepting US dollar debt. People, everybody will want to hold them. The Chinese hold them. Everybody, every now and again, people make a noise about the Chinese hold, hold a lot of um, US dollar debt and so on. But the fact of the matter is that Chinese want it, the Russians want it, the Kazakhstan people want it, and we want it. Give me a US dollar security and I'm going to hold it. <clears throat> Why? Because the US is a trustworthy country and I can rely on them to pay me back. Right? That is true. So they don't worry about that. But every other country, almost, has to worry about the relationship between fiscal deficits and the impact on the exchange rate. So at that end of the spectrum, you have a set of countries whose currencies are freely floating against each other. They trade, they trade on their, their markets, trading, banks are exchanging and trading those currencies, and the people who are the central bankers, they are not particularly worried about it. Every now and again, for example, we know now that the United States dollar, the US dollar index, is extremely high because other currencies have depreciated against the US dollar. The euro is down, the Chinese renminbi is down, and, and they're all down. So the US dollar is now very expensive, okay? That doesn't worry Mr. Obama very much. 
his economy is doing well, unemployment is coming down, his fiscal deficit is under control, he's a little bit worried about inflation and the prospect of deflation, but he's not worried about the exchange rate, the United States dollar, he's not worried about it. So that's at that extreme. In the middle, you have a bunch of countries which uh, peg their currencies to a reserve currency. All right? So that would be like us, like you all, where you have a peg and you locked in to a reserve currency. Now, in your case, your reserve currency is the US dollar, and you fix your exchange rate relative to the US dollar. And you move wherever the US dollar moves, but you have your own currency. Right? The guilder belongs to you. The Barbados dollar belongs to the Bajans, and so on. But right, the Bahamas dollar belongs to the Bahamians, but it's one-to-one. -one, but they move with the US dollar as a peg. And then at the far extreme of the scale, right, you have dollarized countries. Dollarized countries, and this is where uh, um, President Smiley talked about, about partial dollarization and full dollarization. In the case of full dollarization, the country has no currency of its own. Has no currency of its own. It does not issue any currency. It uses somebody else's money to deal with its affairs. Now, come back to the point about sovereign. I am a sovereign country. I have my own government. I have my own borders and so on and so forth. But I have no currency. And therefore, one of the things about sovereignty, because remember when countries say they are sovereign, they are things that you're supposed to have. You're supposed to have a flag. You're supposed to have a national anthem. You're supposed to have a loss-making national airline. And, and, and for some reason, for some reason, airlines are supposed to be a symbol of sovereignty. I don't know why. And 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 you are supposed to have your own currency. Those are the markers of sovereignty. But in the case of a dollarized country, it has no domestic currency. It chooses not to issue one, or circumstances force it to stop issuing its own currency. And let's let me talk quickly about those other cases because they don't apply to you, but they're just, just in the interest of, of, of completeness. You have countries, for example, like Ecuador, and, and President Simile talked about that, right? Like Ecuador, El Salvador, Zimbabwe, right? That got themselves into trouble, serious fiscal trouble, hyperinflation trouble. Uh, in one presentation I do on, on, on dollarization, I give some, I, I went to Zimbabwe a couple of years ago, um, and I still have them. The, 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 the Zimbabwe, when I went there, had trillion dollar notes. I'm not lying. Trillion dollar notes. Notes marked 100 trillion Zimbabwe dollars. Trillion dollars. Inflation, hyperinflation had got so bad that they were issuing money, if you looked at the state of the money, the actual notes, right? So what they had to do eventually, of course, in situations of hyperinflation, you have to abandon the domestic currency because nobody will hold it, right? By the way, and this is an important point, at the end of the day, see, politicians will do what they want to do. At the end of the day, like with everything else, people decide. So if you have a government which wants to debase the currency, create hyperinflation, the people simply walk away from the money. They stop holding it. Because money is based on confidence. If I have no confidence in the money that you're giving me and that, that will retain its value, not only retain its, retain its value in the case of hyperinflation, from hour to hour. You're talking about inflation changing hourly in a place like Zimbabwe at the time. So in those circumstances, people say, I don't want to give, are you, don't give me that money, I don't want to hold that money. I will hold something else, it's like the lady in the bakery, right? Maybe I don't, she's a, I don't think she's worried about hyperinflation in respect of the gilder. So there are other reasons that we need to explore as to why that, that, why that is the case, right? So you have those circumstances. And in the case of Zimbabwe, abandon the Zimbabwe dollar and they start to use the US dollar. They had a lot of difficulty with that. They also used the South African rand and they used a couple of other currencies as well. So they became known as a dollarized economy because they were using the US dollar in, in terms of circulation. It was being used for transactions. But look at where Zimbabwe is relative to where the United States is. Where are they going to get their dollars from? Right? One of the it's very interesting statistics that you gave here because, in fact, President Similar is saying that, that here, 
60% of your deposits are in fact in US dollars. That's an extremely high number. So the truth of the matter is that you're already dollarized, maybe you don't know it. <laughs> but, but in the case of a country like Zimbabwe, because they don't have tourist inflows and so on like you do, they had trouble getting currency, the actual notes that need to be circulated to buy bread and so on and so forth. They had a lot of trouble. So those notes were making the rounds. And I saw a couple of the notes that they had that were terribly worn and so on. You don't have that problem here. So in the case of a pure dollarization, the local, the sovereign local country, uh, country does not issue its own money. It uses somebody else's money. And as President Sibelius said, the, 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 what happens in a situation like that is that you lose that aspect of, of policy, of economic policy. You no, no longer can use monetary policy. Your monetary policy now becomes what the Federal Reserve in the United States chooses to do. Now, if you happen to like what they do, you like Janet Yellen, and she's a wonderful lady, and so on, she's very bright, and so on, uh, and you like what she's doing, well, then you might say, well, I will take her policy, which would mean that you then adopt the United States inflation rate, and whatever the Federal Reserve does in respect of its monetary policy then becomes your monetary policy. Some countries find, a few countries, find that to be appropriate. The countries that find that appropriate, if you look at the list of countries in the IMF reports that are in fact fully dollarized, which would include Zimbabwe and these kind of the countries that President Similia called out, <clears throat> they are what I describe as embedded microstates. So they are very small countries that are embedded within a larger space. They are sovereign territories, so like the Vatican, San Marino, uh, some of the Pacific Islands and so on in relation to Australia. They use the Australian dollar as their, so they're dollarized, but to, to the Australian dollar. Uh, they are very, very small states, just like St. Martin, very small states. But they are geographically, they are embedded inside of a larger geographical space. So I call them embedded microstates. And those states say, yes, I'm sovereign, but you see for me, like Lesotho, in, uh, in, 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 um, which is embedded within South Africa, and Swaziland. Actually, Lesotho and Swaziland also have their own currency, but they actually, effectively, they don't. Because they trade one-to-one -one with Iran, and nobody bothers them, right? Uh, I mean, so they effectively, they, uh, use, they use the, the South African rand as their currency. <clears throat> so, and, and embedded microstates find it convenient and makes a lot of sense for them to use the currency of the larger country that they're embedded in, Europe, as the case may be, or, or, or the, uh, the, the Australians want. In the case of partial dollarization, which is some of the countries that President Simele talked about, uh, you, 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 you may have, like the and Saswajland, you may have a, a local currency, but it's really, it's really ineffective. Or in the case like Panama, Panama has a coin they don't, have, they don't have notes, but they have a coin, the Balboa, right? So notionally, they have a currency, but it really isn't, right? That, that is really isn't the case. So, you, so at the one end of the spectrum, I have zero policy independence. There is nothing that I can do as far as independent monetary policy is concerned. I have my exchange rate weapon, I have taken it away, and I have locked it away. So the politicians have no access to that instrument of policy, which might be a good thing, right? At the other end of the scale, I have freely floating exchange rates where I have complete policy independence. So the central bank could become very active in terms of what it is doing to try to manage the economy in a, in, a, in, a, in a stable fashion. And then in between, I have a bunch of countries which are pegged to a particular currency. Now, countries which are pegged have the option, whenever circumstances warrant it, for them to change the peg, which is to devalue because usually you would want to devalue rather than go the other way around. And, and circumstances, you may want to devalue, so you change the peg. So I move from, say, $2 to $3. I've changed the peg, I have devalued my currency. Why would you do that? Well, the reason why you would do that sometimes is simply because you want to maintain your competitiveness. If the exchange rate is important to your competitiveness, if it is important to your competitiveness, and if you can make a devaluation work, if you can make it stick, 
then using devaluation, changing a pegged exchange rate can be a very valuable tool. The problem with that is that in very many instances, countries mess it up and they don't do it right. And they end up, end up in a worse position after devaluation than they were in before. To get a devaluation right, there are a bunch of things that you have to do. Because you have, as President Simulator talked, the initial effect of a devaluation is that prices are going to rise. You have what we call a price displacement effect. Immediately prices go up. That is not necessarily sustained. It doesn't generate what one would call inflation, but there is a displacement of the price level and then inflation settles back down. If you have a country where you have powerful trade unions, where wages are related to prices in a very powerful kind of way, a very strong way, and the, the, the unions then start to say, well, look, the prices have increased by 10%, I want 12, right? That's happened in Jamaica. Jamaica has never been able to make its evaluation stick because the wages have always chased prices and kept the thing unstable. So they have never got the benefit of a devaluation in terms of the external account. Trinidad made its devaluation stick. Whatever reason, right? We were lucky enough to make our... So devaluation worked in Trinidad in a way that it did not and has not worked in Jamaica. So really, it depends. But managing a devaluation is a complicated task. It is not easy. And it's one of the reasons why some countries elect to say, listen, I am not going to go that route. Barbados, for example, is in considerable difficulty today. Barbados has maintained its exchange rate at two to one, two Barbados dollars to one dollar. Since 1976, it has been that way, and the Bajans are saying, we are not changing it. They're not changing it, although, in fact, the Bajan dollar is appreciating with the peg, because the US dollar is appreciating, and their tourism product is becoming, in my view, increasingly uncompetitive. The Barbados Bajans say, we don't mind that. <clears throat> Because we are not in, our tourism product is not mass tourism. Our tourism product is high-end tourism. We are interested in the European tourists, and therefore the exchange rate is not important to our competitiveness as far as our tourism is concerned. And they may be right. Currently, they have some serious problems in Barbados, which they are struggling with in terms of their debt and so on. So having a pegged exchange rate and being able to change it for a devaluation is a complicated policy that you've got to get right. You have to have, a, you have, to have smart ministers of finance and, and very, very capable central bank people to be able to make it. And you have, to, you have to manage your trade union movement to be able to make it work. If you don't have those things in place, then you might want to think about whether or not you want to go that route. So we come down to the question, is devaluation, sorry, dollarization, is dollarization an appropriate um, choice for St. Martin. Well, you have a number of characteristics here which I think conduce to dollarization. You are a microstate, a very small country. You're not embedded though, because truth is you are a considerable distance from the kingdom, which is in Europe. Your main trade is the other way with the United States. And the other part of your currency union is in Curacao, which is a good distance away. Okay? So there are historical ties and, 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 and the familial ties and so on. But in terms of geographical proximity, when you, when, when you look around your region in St. Martin, what do you have around you? Right? What you have is you have you know, the BVI and Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic and, 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 and the rest of the Caribbean region, all very dollar-oriented. And therefore, it is, it is no surprise that, in fact, when you think about it, your relationship, your peg, if you like, is with the dollar. Because that's where your trading is. That's where your, that's where your investment is. That's where the cruise ships are coming from. Yes, you have some European tourism and so on, but your relationships really are oriented towards the United States. So, so the other thing about embedded is that you're not San Marino or the Vatican or anything like that. You're not... You're not Part, but in terms of, of distance, given what you do, your, what, your, what your main product, tourism, distance really is not that big a deal. Because the tourists are coming to you. 
in the cruise ships. They're coming to you by plane, and therefore distance is less of an issue as far as that is concerned. So you have one tick in the box for, do for dollarization. Okay. The other thing is that you, you, you want to ask yourself the question, should I have an independent monetary policy, an exchange rate policy, and what is that going to do for me? All right. Well, here the question then becomes, <clears throat> how can I maintain my competitiveness in tourism on a sustainable basis over the long term? That is the real question behind this dollarization conversation. That is the real question. Can I, in a dollarized economy, so the US dollar is my medium of exchange and it is my unit of account. It is circulating for all normal transactions and everything in the country is denominated in US dollars. Accounts for companies are done in US dollars. It's a dollarized economy. But with that, can I maintain the competitiveness of my tourism product? Because remember, wherever the US dollar goes, so go you, right? And you can't say that, okay, most of my tourists that are coming are in fact American tourists, and therefore it doesn't matter to them, it does. How does it matter to them? We're talking real, not nominal. So that an American tourist sitting in Philadelphia or in New York or in Chicago saying, where do I go next, okay? Where do I spend that next vacation? He has choice, I can go to St. Martin, in which case, I have a thousand US dollars, I can spend it in St. Martin, no problem. But the euro has declined. So I have the option of a European vacation, which is now cheaper. You have done nothing. You dollarize, right? Your dollars are circulating. The American tourist looks at St. Martin, but also he can look at a, 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 a vacation in France and go and visit the wine growing areas in France and so on because the euro is down. So you have competition. The other source of competition that you might want to be looking very carefully at, <clears throat> and I'm sure that your Minister of Tourism has to be having, I don't think he's having sleepless nights. I think he's strategizing, all right, rather than having sleepless nights at the moment. But it is Cuba. The, 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 I, 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 and I hope that the Caribbean understands the Cuban situation and get their mind around it. We, 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 I'm talking, we, when I say we here, no, I mean the Caribbean, right? The interesting thing about the Caribbean actually is that the Caribbean has been the only, the Caribbean and Canada, and to some extent Mexico, have been the only countries that have stood up against the Americans for this foolish policy that they've had with, again, Cuba for all these decades. And the CARICOM has maintained their relationships with Cuba over the, over the years, years. Now, that has to be worth something. That has to be worth something as far as we are concerned. Because the truth of the matter is that once the Americans get into Cuba, which is, and, and the pace of that is going to surprise you, right? The pace of the negotiations is already taking place, right? They've already had a first round, they're going to have a couple more rounds. And when the thing opens up, the Americans are going to go back and they're going to reclaim Cuba. Investment is going to pour into Cuba. The tourists are going to be pouring into Cuba because it's a new exotic destination that they haven't been to for 50 years, more than 50 years. How are we going to compete with that? where we have to find a way to compete with that. So I'm saying that when you're thinking about dollarization, that is really the question that you're asking. How can I ensure sustainable economic growth and development for St. Martin in the context? How can I maintain competitiveness? And so therefore, when you've taken away the exchange rate by dollarizing, uh, it then means that your competitiveness then comes down to things like service and service excellence.